then we will just get right into this. Uh, so happy to see so many people here. Um, really excited for this conversation. So let's just get started. Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Takatatsu. I am the current vice president of the American Institute of Architecture Students. And I graduated from the University of Colorado Boulder um, before moving out here to Washington DC. Uh, so we're really excited for the session that we have planned tonight and to give you a little bit of a preview. Of course, the topic that we were talking about is culture change in architecture schools. Um, so this has, of course, been something that students and faculty have been calling for for a while. Um, and it, it's this call for a more inclusive and equitable space, particularly for women and BIPOC students. So really happy that we're, we're bringing this to the forefront today. So today, of course, we have with us some faculty and students uh, who have been active in the pursuit of culture change in architecture schools. Um, and all of us here today are really excited to share our thoughts on what is possible when we commit ourselves to changing the culture in architecture education. Uh, today, the conversation is going to be a little bit less about should we or should we not change culture? But uh, of course, instead, uh, we wanna give space for talking about the amazing possibilities when we do commit to change. So the structure tonight is going to be pretty simple. We will have our speakers give a brief introduction of themselves, uh, and we will then work into uh, our breakout sessions that we'll do for about 40 minutes uh, to talk about a set of questions. And then we'll rejoin re as a larger group to discuss uh, what all of our groups had to say. So very participatory. Uh, hope you can turn on your cameras and, and talk about your experiences. Uh, there's going to be a number of questions, uh, six to be exact. Uh, and so definitely encourage everyone to jump around and answer them in whatever order works best for your group uh, or what, whatever works best for you personally. Uh, definitely here to just hear thoughts and experiences. So before I hand it over to Chitika, Noor, Liz, and John, in that order, uh, I wanted to share a little bit about some of the work that the AIS has been doing specifically uh, for over 20 years. The AIS, American Institute of Architecture Students, has been committed to learning and teaching culture policies, formally only talked about as studio culture uh, policies, but we've been talking about it for a long time. We consistently have students uh, and committees and student advocates who are uh, tirelessly working to implement these policies, not only at their own schools, but to share and create resources for other students and educators uh, who are looking to do the same. So I am going to drop this link in the chat. Uh, and this uh, would highly encourage all of you to take a look at the hard work that students have been doing uh, specifically over the past year uh, to create a model learning and teaching culture policy document uh, and related resources. I want to take a moment to give a shout out to NOMA, NAB, ACSA, and the AIA for their role in putting together these resources uh, and having a, a voice in, in some of these things. Uh, so of course, this is uh, slightly tangential to the conversation we're having today because this is really discussion-based, uh, but please feel free to reach out if you have any questions about these specific resources that are listed here. Uh, but we're very proud of them, so I'm sharing them. <laughs> And now moving over into more of the panel discussion. So in preparation for tonight, uh, our speakers went through a <laughs> slightly rigorous process of coming together a couple times to chat about uh, what we thought was relevant to this conversation and aspects that might be interesting to talk about. Uh, so this is a bulleted list of some of the items that we thought were interesting, uh, and we definitely don't have time tonight to talk about all of them, uh, but please, in your breakouts, feel free to use any of these uh, as a place to start discussion or to share your thoughts. Uh, these are some, the questions we ask are very broad, and these are some very specifics um, that we've experienced or seen uh, or think are really exciting. Uh, particularly, I'm interested in some of the glorification of lack of sleep uh, that I don't always think is uh, particular to architecture, but still uh, an interesting one. And and um, of course, how do we uh, include and encourage a culture of generosity, inclusivity, and creativity? And, and how does that relate to culture change? All these, all these pieces, I thought uh, we, we did a good job of creating a cool list. 
so without further ado, uh, thank you all again for being here and participating. And I will hand it off to Chidika to start us off uh, with our presenter uh, introductions and thoughts. Thanks so much. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Chitika, and um, I'm a recent graduate of the BRC program at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I spent my last year there as chapter president of the AIS, which Sarah mentioned is the American Institute of Architecture Students. Um, and prior to that, I had spent quite some time as um, a student leader on the AIS chapter board, but also as an active member of the student body. Um, and so I'm coming at this, of course, from the perspective of a student, but um, more specifically, somebody at a program that had um, an existing and robust studio culture policy um, that was sort of hiding in the woodwork. So our challenge and sort of um, experience for those few years where I was there, uh, when I was there, was to um, increase awareness and also accountability. Those are kind of the two um, things that I find interesting and sort of exciting and perhaps I'm most able to talk about when uh, in the conversation about studio culture. Um, and so we went through several iterations of kind of um, building in measures to sort of examine studio culture and then determine kind of which direction it needs to go. So um, I'm excited to talk with everyone about those things and the plethora of things on the list that Sarah presented. Um, but for now, that's that's all I'll say. And looking forward to meeting people in the breakout rooms. Noor, do you wanna do you wanna take point? Hi everyone. Um, similar, I'm Noor. Similar to Shalika, I also have just been an active member of AS for the past five years. I'm currently in my last year of my Bachelor of Architecture at City College of New York. So I'm looking forward to being done soon. But yeah, so. I feel like one thing that's just been sort of missing from a lot of these discussions has just been student agency. Like a lot of schools have studio culture documents. It's something that we learn about usually in our first week of school. And, but it's a document that existed there before we even got there. And it's usually something that for the most part has been static. Whereas culture isn't something that's static. If we're talking about culture, it's something that you know, it doesn't exist before, I mean, it can exist before you get there, but it's something that you're supposed to build on and it's supposed to involve the people who are a part of it. So I just think in terms of, you know, reframing studio culture into learning and teaching culture, it's really important that it's something that you don't see as a written document and it's something that involves every single person that's involved. And it's something that isn't just important in our schools, but it's something that carries on you know, after our education into architecture practice, that's why it's so important that we're here and we're talking about this and I'm looking forward to seeing where this discussion goes. Liz, do you wanna go next? I think you're muted. Thank you. I was gonna share my screen. Um, so hopefully you can see that. And um, I just have about 15 slides and I just wanted to quickly um, go through just some of my history. So I've worked um, after um, being a practitioner for 18 years, I entered academia and I started to teach at uh, Southern Polytechnic State University in Metro Atlanta. And it was a very small school. It started out kind of as a sister school to Georgia Tech, if you, if you will, in a land grant school that's next to um, Lockheed. And there are about 6,238 students in 2014. And then we found out that we were merging um, almost as a take over with uh, the state of Georgia, did a master plan of all the state schools and merged um, half the schools together, which meant all the, a lot of presidents, there, was, there were two for every one school, so one got pushed out. And so, in, um, and we all found out at 1215 on August 15th, you know, it's like all at the same time, um, from what I understand is the presidents were brought into a room at 1145, it was announced to them and 15 minutes later, it was announced on the news and this is how we all found out. Um, and so about, um, we went through a year 
of, of merging the schools. And then in 2015, all of a sudden Southern Poly was Kennesaw State. It was a mixture of STEM uh, 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 kind of ways of looking at education. So it was engineering and um, STEM on our school and on the other school, it was um, everything else. And so together they looked at it as the, the perfect merger of a larger university. And so now that we have 4,000, 41,000 students, which is now larger than Georgia Tech, which I can't even visualize because we were still on the same campus. Um, and then we found out that um, a year, in 2018, we ended up being overnight on December 18th considered a research university, so R2. So all of a sudden, we're, we're a teaching university, we're three times much bigger, and now we're a, a, um, a, a university that's a, um, a research university. So in terms of my pedagogy, before we merge and even after we merge, I was always very much into exposing the students outside, things that are happening outside of the culture. And I had a lot of travel studios, pretty much every one of my studios, we went somewhere. So we went to Toronto, we went to Vegas, we went to New York, we went to New Orleans. We had clients in those different cities and spent a week or two there. Um, and then when it turned out that we ended up having this merge, one of the incredible benefits was all of a sudden we also had equity. I was able to apply for um, undergraduate research awards for students. And last year I was able to bring seven students. I was given $10,000 and was able to bring seven students that were um, accepted to present at the ACSA conference at Stanford University, um, at the ARCC in Toronto. And so um, I started to really think about, well, now that we have more of a, um, of a, a financial basis that we can actually access, how can, rather than me bringing the students and the culture out, how can we start to bring the culture in? And so one of my roles is I'm coordinator of thesis and it's a five-year program. And so we ended up really looking at the pedagogy and looking at research. Now that we're a research university, how do we bring this into the university? We ended up taking a studio that was integrated, thesis was integrated um, and actually making it three courses. So it's Three thesis prep, thesis research, and then thesis studio, uh, where students actually don't do a capstone, but they really look at one of their interests. They're merged with a perfect with a um, with a primary advisor, and then I'm technically secondary advisors to all the students. As a result, a lot of practitioners started to get really. Um, interested. So we started to do a three minute thesis competition, which a lot of universities do and a local firm gives $3,000 um, to the person that wins. Now we're the third um, uh, university to have the Portman Prize um, by John Portman, which is a local Atlanta based firm. The first was Harvard, the second was Georgia Tech because that's where he went to school. And then a lot of our students ended up working in his office. So now we're the third. So we started to get things that we could actually um, expose our students out. We found this to be a really good opportunity and a way of starting to look at a toolkit to look at the pedagogy for teaching and learning. And we found that students often feel ignored, suppressed um, within the current system. And so we started to develop this, you know, how do you figure out the student teacher relationships where there's openness to change, students have an idea of self transcendence, self enhancement, um, conservation, uh, meaning that, that we look at the uh, conformity, um, the idea of like the hierarchy um, between student and teacher, um, and then hedonism, meaning shouldn't there be pleasure? Shouldn't studio be pleasure? Shouldn't design be pleasure, pleasurable? And so then I personally came up with these four ways of looking at the toolkit. So one of them is the only thing constant is change. And so if we pick up or I pick up on Noor's culture is not static, it's a very similar type of relationship. Um, and if we all came back and all of a sudden studio was one way where it was in the studio culture was in the classroom. And now we're um, forced because of COVID-19 again to relook at things and learning that that the only thing constant really is change and how do we constantly approach that um, with the way we teach. And then the second is inconvenience is the creator of innovation. And so one of the classes I teach is environmental technology. And if you look historically at this bridge um, on the um, right side, it was this narrow area where cows would go through and you could never access it. And so um, this incredible bridge ended up being um, designed that um, rather than the typical 
a lot of trust system and ended up having this much more innovative system that was being able to be built as a result to solving this problem. And then today, more the inconvenience of the creator it's of innovation ends up being more about adding in technology and how do we do that um, when we are inconvenienced or wanna make things quicker, we wanna go shopping and not carry our shopping bags. Um, how do we, um, as designers start to approach that end, that this is something that's changed um, and something that we can apply to um, problem solving. And then the third is connectivity is what shapes our built environment. So the notion, especially now that it's COVID-19, the notion that connectivity with students and teachers and faculty and learning becomes a really important thing that we've got to tackle. And to start to understand that as architects, as part of our responsibility to look at connectivity and how it does shape our built environment. Um, even down to building and the, the uh, devoid of humanism, if we add in too much technology and we're too disconnected, um, how, do, how are we aware of that? And so then the fourth and last one is reverse mentoring. So for me, it's really how do you connect um, and have an interaction between studio and faculty where actually when a lot of this um, started to go down in terms of having to do everything on Zoom, I learned how to do everything from my students. My students were like, oh no, this is how you share a screen. This is how you do this. Let me set it up for you. Send me all your stuff. And so it ended up that I started to learn more on how to communicate with my students from my students rather than the other way around. And so the idea of reverse mentoring, I think becomes really important um, where students can actually have a, 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 a say and also begin to transform um, the cultural of, of how we teach. Um, basically by reinforcing a digital knowledge, um, developing a more user-centric point of view, um, bridging the gap between generation and building links and networks of knowledge um, between um, faculty and students um, and awareness of what they can bring. And so just to sort of sum up, um, so the four big issues or things that I tend to look at is one is the only thing constant is change, two, the inconvenience, in the, is the creator of invention, and three, connectivity is what shapes our built environment, and four, reverse mentoring. And so that's what I have to share today. And so I also am looking very much forward to um, a sh um, having in breakout rooms, getting in a discussion with students and faculty alike. So, thank you. So I so jump over to John. Thanks, Liz. I really appreciate the, the depth of that. I appreciate the way that it uh, maintains itself still within uh, you know, a rigor of architectural thought that is the way toward that, um, that uh, stronger learning teaching culture. That's really strong. I also just want to say thanks to Sarah and the collaborators that you worked with in creating that learning teaching culture policy project. That document's already been a huge help to us. And to our students who are, you know, uh, uh, really helping us a lot and shaping that for us. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen as well, uh, if I can figure this out. How's that look? Perfect. Uh, so this is our mission. It was not our original mission, uh, but the original, uh, the first part of that has always remained for us. Uh, we are a small private school. We're a newly accredited school in Minneapolis. Uh, we started about seven years ago, uh, really in response to uh, the Great Recession and what impact it had on our profession. So a, a school was uh, identified as very much needed in our region to strengthen the profession again, but largely in the beginning, that was about repopulating. And as we grew and we expanded, we started to realize that our demographic as a school focused on the profession, our demographic began to evolve into something that reflected the profession, which we were not very proud of. Uh, and we began to dig deep into figuring out why this was because the hope, I, I think the hope for us as a school uh, is that perhaps we could hold some solution for the profession in the way that we were approaching education if we could start to solve this, uh, this issue within ourselves. Uh, so this became our, our evolving um, uh, mission. 
And we really started to see diversity as uh, coming at this from very two very different dimensions. One in, on, in the people and the makeup of who we are as faculty and students administration, but also in the way that we expose ourselves to diversity uh, through our curriculum and through the ways that we, uh, we give up uh, our students an opportunity, all of us an opportunity to serve. Um, and this is kind of what our curriculum used to look like. And this is where we started by, by, with making that change. And this is the old um, NAB uh, curriculum map. But uh, we really started to try and understand what was possible within an opportunity where several things were coming to an intersection for us. One was the transformation of the NAB conditions as we were moving toward a new NAB conditions. The other was uh, initial accreditation. And a third for us was a change from uh, to a shorter semester. Uh, so we started to see the possibility of, of, of rethinking the curriculum at the, from the beginning, starting with this new mission in mind. Uh, so we began by uh, developing first step toward developing the curriculum. We began by developing an equity, diversity, inclusion plan. And this was a faculty and student and uh, administrative collaborative efforts that, uh, that took place over several months. Uh, and we sort of uh, distilled ourselves down to a few key goals. And the first one, first one was really transforming the curriculum itself. Uh, and one of the things we looked at when we kind of did an audit of where we were at in terms of how we were teaching at the curricular level uh, was the credit hour issue. And this was something that we as faculty all had very um, uh, varying uh, approaches and opinions to. And at different stages in the curriculum, there were different um, uh, expectations and outcomes that were happening in terms of the credit hour issue. Uh, and, you know, I think that perhaps all of us probably have a sense that in most schools of architecture, we exceed that credit hour, uh, that clock hour, um, uh, that, uh, you know, a designation that the USDE gives us by a, probably a very significant amount. And we started trying to track that and to see where that was happening and with the goal of maintaining that uh, clock hour, uh, that clock hour regulation. And the big thing for us there was when, when we were looking at our demographic and we were seeing where we were losing BIPOC students, female students, much of it had to do in some way with schedule. There was a, an, an inflexibility in the way that we were existing from a schedule perspective that uh, created um, uh, some expectations that, that certain people just couldn't meet. And you know, to uh, to Sarah's point, and one of the things in our bullets about respecting um, the you know respecting the, uh, the the need for sleep, uh, we are not a campus that is open 24 hours. And there was discussion about doing that. And when we started to look at that as an equity issue, uh, we have many students who simply cannot work at night. They simply cannot put in those kinds of hours. So we try. We are trying now in this new curriculum to very much set up a system where there is uh, an equitable um, expectation and the resources align to that. Uh, so uh, much of what you'll see in, those, in that curricular goal is about ma making sure we can uh, maintain that schedule. And obviously there are dual benefits, minimizing credit totals. We were a little over the 150 credit uh, 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 minimum before. So we've, we've decided to sort of uh, uh, shrink that down. Uh, expanding the ways we deliver, we were already thinking about before. Now we've been uh, forced to expand the ways that we deliver, and I think much for the better. Uh, certainly, as we move forward indefinitely, I think we are still very much thinking about how we can continue to deliver things online and in person to accommodate varying ways of thinking. We're right now trying to track and assess the students in terms of how much how much, uh, how some students may be excelling more in learning online versus those who may be struggling to try to see that as another way of thinking, another form of diversity that we can accommodate. Uh, and then we also looked at the ways that that could inform the curriculum through these other goals, particularly the ways that we could build bridges. And, you know, I, I think oftentimes it's, it may be um, easy for us to look at demographics in an isolated sense in the sense of where we are at in academia. Uh, but we want to mitigate and foster diversity throughout the profession. Our goal is very much how do we, how do we uh, build those bridges all the way from high school to leadership in the profession uh, in the ways that we do things at every stage. So the curriculum, while it's you know, much more focused on you know, those, those middle goals, those middle bridges, uh, it's very much from the mindset of looking at it in a broader sense. 
And one of those big things for us is maintaining that path and shortening that path to licensure. So the integrated path to architectural licensure is a big program for us that we are not yet an official uh, uh, a participant in yet. We're still fairly newly accredited and we're waiting to kind of get this new curriculum on its feet before we uh, start to dive into that. But we do already accommodate that. And I will say, I can say uh, now uh, officially that we have a a licensed architect as a graduate. Our first graduate just passed his final exam a couple of days ago. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but we do have a, a path to licensure. And, and again, the, the flexibility in the schedule uh, is again, very important to us uh, from this perspective as well, so that we allow students the opportunity to work while they're in school, the opportunity to gain hours while they're in school, introducing them to NCARB and that record very early on in their education, giving them a training for ARE while they're in school. Uh, and giving them opportunities to, to, to gain that licensure as quickly as possible. And again, that for us, much of that is about the bridges that we want to see uh, that we can contribute to building after, uh, after graduation. And this is our, how our new curriculum has mapped itself out. And we have about the way that we sort of thought about this in the past, everything was uh, very sequential. Uh, and there were a lot of co-requisite or prerequisite courses. There was an academic plan that was fairly fairly rigid, fairly um, lockstep. And when we looked at uh, the BARC uh, curriculum initially, we sort of had an attitude that maybe it sort of had to be that way. But once we started to really audit again and really look at the outcomes, look at the opportunities that are, are latent in the new NAB conditions, uh, look at what we can do with our new um, uh, semester schedule, we began to see all of the ways in which we could offer courses out of sequence uh, in varying sequences in different delivery methods. So what you'll see in this diagram are the, the, the courses that are, are surrounded by a solid outline are the courses that are sequential. So really now it's just the studio courses that are sequential along with the, a couple of the courses that tie to the final thesis here. Uh, everything else is not a pre, pre or co-requisite. It can be taken out of sequence within its degree program. So we are still two degree programs and associates in the first two years and then a bachelor's in the final three uh, with, with that flexibility within. And the biggest thing that we discovered when we built in the associate's degree, which we are now poised to be able to take more full advantage of by offering uh, more online offerings nationwide is the ability to serve uh, the other two-year programs, uh, the, which you know the uh, CCAP, the Coalition for Community College of Architecture Programs has been an amazing organization that I've had uh, the privilege to collaborate with and that we there have been an enormous amount of discoveries about the, the diversity and the number of students that are in two year programs uh, and the struggles that they all have uh, for continuing their education forward in many cases having to start over. And what we sort of discovered in our in our degree system by developing ourselves from that two year degree is that we are a very friendly transfer program so uh, students are, are very much able to transfer into the third year and continue on. So it's a, it's a pretty exciting uh, time for us to be able to offer a three-year path to licensure for students from uh, community and technical colleges, but also to offer our own students that five-year degree. But even more so, I think that the flexibility of the degree is something that we are, are very excited to roll out. So this will uh, begin for us um, in a uh, fall of 2021. So we are still very much in the trying stage. Uh, we are in the depths right now of learning how and uh, what, by what measure we, we might choose to assess the new curriculum. Um, and we're very excited to see where it can go. Um, and I look forward to the conversations uh, over the course of this, this session about uh, curriculum and in uh, many of the other issues. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you so much to all of our speakers. Those were really great introductions and I think really great entry points into this multifaceted conversation that uh, lives in the student experience, it lives in the administration experience, it lives in the curriculum, and, and it lives in all these places um, and is not isolated to any of these. So I'm really glad we got to hear so many different perspectives. Uh, we'll be switching into our breakout rooms in a second. I'm going to post the questions. They might look a little long here in the chat, um, but we have six questions. Oh, wow, they look really long in there. That's 
bullet points did not come through. <laughs> I will read them out for everyone really quickly. Uh, and again, in your rooms, um, this is definitely a space to engage. It's going to, you know, inform those around you. But then when we we share back, it's it's going to be content for all of us to hear. So. Um, really encourage uh, thoughtful uh, discussion here uh, around what are the building blocks for teaching and learning culture? Are there tangible or intangible dimensions? Uh, the second question, why is, why is it important to seek out culture change? What are the promises or benefits that come? Uh, that's an exciting one for me. I like that one. I uh, will read the third one. Uh, <laughs> to initiate change, uh, one needs to sense uh, needs a sense of the outcome. How is this best done? How do you get students and faculty involved? The fourth question, how do schools understand their culture and or the need for change? Is it an event, external circumstances? What conditions enable transparency and self-understanding? That's that's a juicy one. Uh, the fifth question, what by what means can we assess culture change? And sixth, how do you sustain culture change? What factors influence longevity beyond one year? Obviously, obviously we don't have enough time for all of those. Uh, so I, again, encourage a messy discussion going all over the place, uh, answering what comes up first, um, but really excited for these. So we will move into breakouts. Um, Mike Monty will uh, assign us all and we will see you there. Uh, feel free to copy these into your own notes uh, if you would like. See you all in the breakouts. You'll have a facilitator to guide you through this. Don't worry. <laughs> Looks like we are coming back together. Thank you so much for sticking around. I know it's uh, a little bit later in the evening for a few of us. Um, I want to take the time for our facilitators to kind of go around uh, and, and talk about some of the themes, big topics that came up. Um, we, you, you have you know, about uh, five minutes each to kind of share out if you want to take that time. Um, definitely wrote some notes down myself, but I'll hand it over to, uh, let's, let's go in order of um, our uh, speakers. Uh, Chidika, do you wanna go first? Sure, um, is my audio okay? Okay, cool, cool. Uh, I had, uh, as you know, Murphy's Law is a thing. So I, of course, was disappeared from my own uh, conversation. But um, when I came back, it sounded like the rest of the room continued to have a very productive discussion. So I will take that as a good sign um, that this was this was useful. Um, but I we had some really great, you know, I, uh, we had a really great conversation. I think some big key takeaways that I hope everyone else will also find sort of useful or easy to relate to are that it sounded like from everyone's very different experiences that the common thread was kind of student agency. Um, sometimes that was the challenge or sometimes sort of getting students to feel like they um, did have a space in the conversation or, you know, were even sort of allowed to ask for a space in the conversation was a challenge. Um, but other times the push came from the students. Um, and I don't think as a former student, I will say, I don't think that absolves, you know, faculty or school administration from um, doing any of the work. I think it just sort of means that on the other end, being receptive, be, or even more than that, sort of being proactive in seeking um, student participation and creating a safe space for feedback and a sort of legitimate, um, realistic feedback loop is, is sort of what the, the takeaway from that is. That's a sort of hard task to do. Um, and so speaking of the feedback loop, we also discussed um, the sort of challenge of having a genuine process leading into the creation of a studio, studio culture policy document. Um, a lot of people sort of have an existing document, but it's really just addressing logistics like studio cleanliness and those kinds of things. Um, and it might have sort of um, literature about maybe more intangible things, but really um, it's the complex, like the difficult thing to do is to be meaningful about measuring things like, you know, pre performance or student satisfaction or like healthy work environment. So um, I'm not going to try to answer the question of how to do that. I think uh, the takeaway that was new to me also from the conversation was that um, at institutions where people are pushing for a more robust and accurately representative process. They've noticed that it's gone from being sort of linear and straightforward and quick 
too complex and sort of difficult and um, challenging, but I think that's a positive transition. So, you know, as people who are invested in this or trying to learn about this and hopefully taking some of these conversations back to our own experiences as students or faculty, pushing studio culture and general learning and teaching culture, I think the the, the thing to know is that if it's getting harder to do or you're having more difficult conversations and there's um, it's less easy and taking more time, that's a good thing. It's not maybe the most convenient, but that's a more positive transition than having like a two-step, you know, revision spell checking process on your documents. So um, yeah, I guess that's, I'll wrap it up there. Uh, what a great conversation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Noor, is that, are you up next? Hi, and we also had Scott um, co-facilitating, so Scott, also feel free to jump in. Yeah, jump in. Um, our discussion was more holistic on sort of building blocks and culture versus institution. Um, my favorite quote that was said is probably, the profession needs to die and be reborn from the ashes. Um, it spoke about how architecture education also drives the culture of the profession. And in order for us to have a less homogenous profession, one that truly is inclusive and celebrates a lot of different cultures, it has to start within the doorsteps of our institutions. Um, and then in terms of what actually makes up that culture and how do we seek culture change? One thing that was said was, we don't have to seek it, that culture change seeks us and it's all around us. And it's more so whether we accept it and we actually accept things that are going on around us and what we do about that. Um, and one other thing that was said was that it actually takes privilege to, to ignore the changes that are happening around us because maybe they're not affecting us as much. So being receptive to that, um, being receptive to the needs of students. Um, and, and one more thing, especially considering our, our current climate and the context of our times is we also need to, like one part of culture also has to be looking at what students are graduating into and what needs of the students are not being met in terms of you know, what comes after architecture education? How do we retain students in practice? Um, just one quick summary. Scott, if you want to add to it, feel free. Yeah, I'll add my thoughts on um, just a few things that I really liked that were said in our conversation. First of all, was that we need to be less reactionary as a profession, as an education, um, which obviously is what we're all doing here. We're trying to be less reactionary and, and think more forwardly. So I'm really glad that we're on this conversation, but something to keep in mind as we move on. Um, another thing is that schools, most schools want cultural change and they want more diversity. Um, you know, that's in the mission statement. We want it, but we're hesitant to take action toward that change especially when it comes to changing curriculum, um, you know, taking those actionable steps. And a lot of that comes down to the individual actions of, you know, administration, of faculty members, even of students. Um, if you present an idea and the faculty, it, that's not what the faculty wants to come out of their studio, they can just make the decision right there to stop that change. Uh, so, so obviously that's a difficult answer. It's a difficult problem to combat, but it's something that we all need to keep in mind that it's a lot of it's about the actions of individuals um, and what we want out of the educational process. Um, another thing is that I think we all understand that architectural education drives the st structure and culture um, and value of the profession. And so the education must change in order to the profession to change. And I did, I did like the quote, the profession needs to die and re be reborn from the ashes. That was nice. I didn't say that, by the way, I wanna clarify that it was a professional that said that, so it was justified. Um, and then another thing I really liked was that we discussed the need to provide more access to education, even in an informal manner, um, you know, providing students education that they don't necessarily live at the studio, they're not spending all their time there. Um, they didn't just come out of high school and are getting into this education. People who are informally educated, who are just coming there as a commuter, who have lives to live, provide a really rich diversity. Um, and, and we appreciate their perspectives just as much as the traditional students. So we need to open up roads for them to get into that education. Um, those were a few points that 
that I really liked in our conversation. And I did want to plug just really quick while I have the chance, the learning and teaching culture advisory group for the AIS. We discussed this in our talk a little bit. Um, this is a new committee that the AIS has devised this year. It's focused on just what it sounds like developing learning and teaching culture in individual schools across the country. Um, so this is just a dedicated set of students that are, you know, learning and teaching culture um, agents and they're experts on learning and teaching culture. They've studied those um, documents that the AIS has been putting out and they're there to help students, faculty, administrators in those discussions and to help them rewrite their learning and teaching culture policies in an effective way, in a way that's actionable and is not just you know, how we take care of our building. Um, so if you'd like to get in contact with us, I will put the um, email for the committee in the chat and we would love to talk to any of you. Thank you. AIS plugs all day long. Love it. Great. Um, Liz, do you want to speak next? Sure. Um, in our, our room, I was also with David Trinidad, who is a, a co-facilitator or really took over as, co as facilitator, um, and he needs to hop off um, pretty soon. So I was going to pass it off to him. He's um, our, at Kennesaw State. He's our president of the AIS, so another plug for AIS. But he also um, is running off um, in like three minutes to do an open door session with some younger classmen to help them navigate this particular situation that we're in because of COVID-19 and a series of other things. So his work continues through the night. Um, and I just love the fact that students are so proactive in this, but I'm going to pass it off to David and then he can pass it back when he has to hop off and I'll finish. Yeah, no, it was a privilege to be part of the conversation. Um, I felt outclassed by the people I was with. It was awesome. It was like the director of programs. And so it was fun to be in a conversation like that. One of the things that I appreciated about our conversation being that there was a lot of leadership in the, um, like a lot of leadership in schools in our breakout room was the idea that studio culture is bigger than just studio. Um, it starts with the leadership and it goes all the way down to the bedrock classes. And so things like, you know, pulling all nighters or just the various parts of studio culture that seem to be kind of honed in on aren't necessarily studio related as much as they are the foundational classes related. So learning how to communicate your ideas, how to do digital modeling, um, all those things can be really important. So most of our conversation kind of was around that. Um, and then I did learn about some cool um, things like iPal. I didn't know anything about it, uh, which is a shame as a student, I should know about iPal, uh, which I thought was really cool. So I'm gonna go Google that uh, once I'm done with this. But again, thank you guys for inviting me in. Um, I appreciate it, Professor Martin and Sarah for facilitating it. But I do have to go, so thank you guys, appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to, to follow up um, with the iPal program, um, University of Florida, described how they're having 10 graduates and they're going to be, begin to evaluate the program so that others can begin to learn from it, which we thought was really interesting. And we had um, a, a, a Douglas McLeod, who is part of the Global Studio, but also an all online course um, at a Canadian university. And um, it's he talked a lot about um, how students learn differently online versus um, in person, face to face, and also having a, a, a less structure that's so constrained that students can't accommodate their um, their learning needs, but also their personal lives. And so I thought, um, or what is going on? So that I thought that was really interesting and a way for us to learn about that. And then um, one of the um, uh, the people in our, our room said that they started to really rewrite their um, their. Uh, uh, their equity um, and, and culture. And it, it's not just to relate studio culture, but actually just the culture of the university or the department as a whole. The studio, making a studio culture policy, they felt was um, part of the problem is making studio the most important thing. And so how do you look at it as a global thing? And so they came up with three key ideas about transparency, communication, and creating a safe space for all students. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, we also talked a little bit about co-op programs and how to include those. Um, there was a school um, that brought a, a case study where a student could go out and do community engagement and then get a class credit for that, um, not just an internship in, a, in an office. But we talked a lot about how um, to not have such a fixed way of looking at the curriculum and how to have breadth 
in it so the students could actually accommodate um, and still successfully create their, their um, degree. And um, I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah, so yeah, it was really <laughs> interesting. Um, Just a little bit of a conversation there. Sounds really in depth. <laughs> Fantastic. And and we do have um, six, seven minutes left. Uh, so John, if you could briefly uh, describe a little bit of, of your group. I don't get all six, seven minutes. I guess. You don't get all six, seven okay. minutes. I have to, I get it. I get, <clears throat> no, I, I can be, I can be succinct. Um, no, we had a, also a very great discussion. Um, Tim and James both uh, gave some great insight into uh, the need for research and particularly James uh, talked about the need for a research, a, a stronger research culture within uh, schools of architecture as a way of approaching a learning and teaching culture, uh, which I thought was a really, uh, a really powerful thing to think about. Um, uh, Susan gave us some understanding about, you know, how our schools can best reflect our commu the communities that we serve in, and, uh, and then again, stressing the diversity in the profession again. Um, Eklas and Jane uh, talked about the importance of articulation with community colleges, but also um, the importance of having a strong relationship with high school counselors to begin to, sh to continue shifting the, the perception of what architecture is and making sure that, um, you know, those who the, those who may be, have been told things about why they can't be an architect or why architecture is not for them, that some of those barriers are broken in the way that we can reach out to make those relationships. Um, and then Carlo really stressed uh, the larger elephants in the room, I guess I could say, uh, just making sure that you know there we don't lose sight of some of the larger issues at hand and particularly the economic issues and the cost of education uh, and how important we must, we, you know, we, that despite all of our best efforts, if we cannot address the cost of education, uh, then, you know, then, then, we, um, then we may be uh, not able to address some of the other issues that we want to. Um, uh, and then uh, Erin really closed us out strongly. She, she uh, very much stressed that, you know, there is no one answer to this problem, uh, but uh, that at the heart of it all is communication and collaboration. So uh, to me, I thought those were the perfect two words to really close out all of what we've been talking about. Powerful, powerful. And I do apologize. We have one more. Uh, Lynn Dearborn uh, also has a group to, to share some really powerful thoughts, I'm sure. Just, just a couple of things to, um, to add. Um, much, of, much of what happened in our, or discussed in our room was, was covered by others. But I think one, one key point that was made is, you know, we, we are this group of people who prides ourselves on creativity and thinking outside the box. And yet we have a, often have a lot of difficulty in thinking creatively and outside the box when it comes to modification and change in architectural education. Um, we were fortunate to have a, a, a few individuals um, uh, Victor, who came to us um, from Bolivia, and uh, uh, Mark Olney, who um, actually came to us from a program in Uganda and then um, in the UK now, but they were talking about the transformations that those programs have undergone. And I think it was, it was interesting because the theme of bringing more, um, getting students to do other things and not be so focused on just the traditional education. Um, so Victor was talking about this, they, they, the students have to go out and do five courses that are not part of the university. So they're not even electives, right? So yoga or uh, learning to cook culinary, right? And then bringing that back and enriching the educational process through doing that. and. Um, and Mark was talking about, you know, actually getting students to engage and uh, talk with the public, right? So that early on and have that, bring that back into the school to enrich the conversations that are happening in the school as, and, and not have such a traditional top-down approach to the way that we're doing everything. Um, and I think those are, you know, some things that were echoed in other 
um, other conversations. There, there are probably many other things that, that were in our conversation, but I just wanted to add those two and, and thank everybody that was in, in the room um, for, the, for the great conversation. Fantastic, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to our facilitators. Uh, I will, I'm trying to think of how I wanna end this because our group, uh, it felt like was full of change agents and just really got into the, the bread and butter of just what it means to, to do this uh, and gave tips and tricks and were um, really kind of challenging each other. I think of like, well, what do I do in this situation and, and talking about, uh, you know, the, the tangible pieces of things. Um, and we, we went all, we covered so much ground and, and talked about, um, you know, communication uh, across all levels, um, you know, where power lies and, and bringing up voices, um, but then, you know, being super transparent and having uh, leadership uh, exhibit transparency through this this process and understanding this, this moment that we, in, we are in culturally, um, is impacting uh, what we're experiencing now. And, and it's hard to compare. Uh, it's important to remember the past, but then comparing uh, the current moment in, in it, all its complexity of COVID, of social change and these, these pieces. My, my favorite quote, I don't know if they <laughs> know, I, they quote, were quoted, but uh, external forces make reality crash in on architecture pedagogy. Reality is here and it is changing um, how we all experience our lives, but it's also crashing in on architecture pedagogy. Um, and I, I hope uh, you know that the challenge in that crash is what we're all feeling right now and communication is hard. And um, I really appreciate every single person that's here to learn how to communicate uh, more clearly and to absorb uh, these stories and experiences from others. I hope we continue this conversation and I hope you got something out of this today. Uh, I know I definitely did. Uh, so thank you all for participating. Thank you to our uh, panelists and the, all the work they are doing um, and hope to hear from all of you soon. Um, thank you everyone. Uh, hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thanks everyone.